We have to warn you up front, some of the things we talk about in this series will be disturbing for some listeners. So you should exercise caution, and please remember, this podcast is unlikely to be suitable for children. We are grateful for your support of the Cold Case Foundation. Stay safe, wherever you are. In the first full season of Out of the Cold, we explored the case of serial killer Robert Rhodes turning to the experts from the Foundation team to help learn the lessons which can prevent truck driving criminals from offending in future. In season 2, which is at the start of production now, we will be taking a deep dive into another case, showing how expertise and the dedication of the investigators turned a mystery into a conviction. In between, we didn't want to leave you with nothing. So, the team thought carefully about it and James wants to tell you some of his formative stories from policing. We feel that these give you some valuable insight into what it's like to be at the scene when the worst has happened or is still happening. We've protected real people by changing some of the details relating to these incidents. Investigators and first responders don't learn most of their skills from books. We learn through sound, sight and smell. We learn from each other and from listening to those little feelings but being able to recognise when they're leading us up the garden path. I want you to learn a little bit about those sight, sounds and smells and how that little feeling can manifest so you can understand what the reality of casework is. I'm James Patrick, Director of Intelligence at the Cold Case Foundation and this is out of the cold. I haven't felt like a 25 year old for quite a while. I'm not going to lie to you about that. My knees make some pretty incredible noises these days and every little injury acquired in a variety of fights over the years makes itself known whenever cold damp weather arrives. But I can still remember 25 because of the events which marked my second year as a police officer. When you've started to settle into the role, which there is nothing quite like, and it definitely isn't just a job, you start to kid yourself that you've gotten the hang of it, that the transition between the 12 weeks of training in a bubble where it's all safe and you getting out in a car with a tutor, taking you to ludicrous and often scary incidents was the hardest bit. It's not. Every day is a school day, especially if you're a magnet for the unusual, which I am. There is another type of magnet, the shit magnet which some people often confuse with this, but that's a different thing altogether. Shit magnets are the ones who get the jobs which won't go away, no matter what you do with them. If you get crewed up with one, how your shift turns out is in the hands of greater beings. A weird magnet is in a special category all of its own. So let me give you an example of what I mean. Back in my first year, I was doing a front desk rotation and this guy walked in with a busted nose. He was well known and came from a criminal family, but was not himself at least considered to be a massive problem. Our desk civilian, who'd served 30 years before taking up a civilian role, was taking the old school approach and telling him to go away. I wasn't that cynical then, and never actually got that cynical, because we have this duty of care to everyone as equals. So, I took over. I spoke to this guy and realised pretty quickly that he also had some kind of mental health issues which were affecting his welfare and making him vulnerable to the local network of heroin and crack addicts and exposing him to their patterns of violent robbery and playing violence for the sake of violence. I sat this chap down in the side room, helped him out with some first aid and offered an ambulance which he obviously refused. Then I took as detailed a statement as was possible having ascertained that he didn't need an appropriate adult to be present as a process witness. I even got him a cup of tea. A few hours later, his statement was done, and the long and short of it is that the two offenders got nicked, charged, and found guilty of a Section 18 assault, which is grievous bodily harm. For me, that was it. I saw him around on the street every now and then, and he was always polite and thankful, but no more so than anyone else. He did say it was the first time he'd been treated with any real humanity, 
which is just how I thought it should be. Fast forward three years, when I was working in the intelligence office, and my colleague calls me out to one of the drugs warrants which had been planned and executed that day. You've got to see this, Jim, he says to me on a point-to-point radio transmission. So I took a walk down to the estate and into the flat that had its door hanging off the hinges, and a few uniformed cops are inside bagging things up. My colleague that radioed me is in the living room. Me, is this a head fuck or what? He says to me. Is what a head fuck? I ask, looking around at just another filthy drug addict's flat in a long list of many that I'd been to by that point. The walls, you idiot, he says. I look around properly for the first time and notice that there's writing everywhere. So I step in close, many years before I needed glasses, and then my mouth drops open and my colleague starts laughing at me. The words PC James Patrick are written in different pens and writing sizes everywhere. The flat belonged to the guy from years before, and treating him decently had made an impact because he didn't forget me. It turns out that this was his way of trying to call for help through an episode of psychosis. This is what I mean by weird magnet, so hopefully you have a better feel for it now. Being a magnet for unusual incidents doesn't stop at one. Once it's switched on, it's on, and you attract every odd job on a full moon and almost every imaginable kind of out of the usual call over the radio. With this scene set a little bit and turning back to my second year of policing, I was crewed up with another officer on the inquiries car. We called them alpha cars and we get a buzz over the radio. Can you pull in a quick safe and well check for us on the way back to the Nick? The dispatcher asks. This is never good. It always happens near the end of your shift when you've already got a bucket load of admin to do, and it nearly always means you're about to land a time-involved incident. Sure, we say, young and keen, and trying to keep our sergeant on side so he'd sign off our blues and twos driving courses. So off we go. It's a lower middle class street in a decent suburban area, large family home occupied by a hard-working group of people. The concern is for the husband, who hasn't been seen, but was expected to be at home. The time-involved job unveils itself fairly quickly. He isn't missing. He's in a workshop at the back of the house. What we're dealing with is a deceased male in his 50s, hanging from a strap attached to a beam on the ceiling. A clapped stack of wooden blocks are beneath his knees, and a mirror is in front of him. The surrounding details are clearly sexual in nature, and I'm not going to share them, because they're not really any of your business. The scene itself was strange, and the wooden blocks were the cause of that little feeling, which is the way your brain assembles information and tells you it's reached an important conclusion, but isn't quite ready to fully explain it. Our first duty, when we arrive at jobs, is saving life and limb, and it was clear that this man was dead, in full rigor mortis. The paramedic arrived nonetheless and confirmed the death within 30 seconds and left again. We immediately set up a scene, started a log, making sure that we created a common approach path in what space there was. The reason we do all of this is to preserve any potential forensic evidence, to create a record of who's been there, because this may explain the presence of certain materials or trace materials in later forensic examination. It's also a really fast way of being able to request elimination samples from police officers, support staff, such as scene examiners or even undertakers. Scenes of crime happen to be just around the corner, so we actually managed to get photographs done straight away, which meant we could get the strap off the beam and carefully lift the guy down to the floor. A quick lesson here, you always leave the knot intact because knots can be the crucial evidence in a murder. I was grateful that we were able to get him down because it's hard to explain really what a hung person looks like because they move slightly and in a silent space and deaths are always absolutely silent. You can hear the slight creak of the ligature. We called the undertaker who come out over here at least to collect the bodies and take them either to the rest home or the mortuary. And then we got set about the admin side of police work. The first decision that we have to make in a case like this is whether the death is suspicious, meaning there is the potential that we've arrived at a murder, or is it something else? A suicide, for example. Both trigger a different series of actions. I went through the scene, 
seizing the items which told the story of what he was doing, while my colleague took a statement from the wife who'd been home and not realised he was out in the workshop. Being young in service, we duly called out our sergeant, who listened to what we had to say and agreed with our conclusion. And what we decided was murder and suicide were ruled out really quickly, and that what we were dealing with was a highly unusual accidental death. What happened was that the deceased had developed a fetish for autoerotic asphyxiation and practiced it alone when he thought the house was empty. He was using wooden blocks to increase and decrease the pressure on his neck. On this occasion, he'd used too few blocks and passed out. Then, as his body relaxed, the rest of the blocks knocked out from under his knees and the ligature strangled him while he was already unconscious. So it was a tragic, tragic accident. Autoerotic asphyxiation is the practice of cutting your own oxygen supply off, either for arousal or climax. The most internationally famous death this way, that I can think of at least, was the lead singer of In Excess, Michael Hutchins. There is another case in which a person created a vacuum sealing device for themselves using a vacuum cleaner, a wooden frame and some plastic sheeting. They were discovered deceased after the neighbours reported nuisance noise from the hoover. In this case, after the undertakers were gone, the evidence was collected, sealed up, the scene was closed and we returned to the police station and started assembling the coroner's file. This was and still is a detailed piece of work and before it could be completed I had to attend my very first autopsy. I didn't really know what to expect but it was a mixture of fascinating and stomach churning. The pathologist, who by chance happened to be an expert in autoerotic asphyxiation cases, walked me through the whole thing and, importantly, confirmed the version of events suggested by the scene and the witness accounts through the examination. With that done, the file was completed and two actions were left. The first was to deal with a complicated family dispute which had arisen, in which the relatives on the deceased side were trying to blame the wife for driving him to suicide. This simply wasn't the case, and having tried a number of different approaches, the close family members agreed that they could be told the whole truth. In the end, this created a lot of discomfort because they just didn't know what to say, but it did solve the dispute for good. The next step was to take the file to the coroner and brief them ahead of the inquest. This was my first coroner's briefing, and I even went as far as demonstrating the position of the body and explaining the mechanics and wider background to autoerotic asphyxiation as described to me by the pathologist and some follow-up research which I'd done. The coroner had never dealt with one of these cases either. I was also keen that we tried to protect the family by making the inquest as uninteresting to reporters as possible, and the coroner agreed. On the day, they clipped their questioning and simply asked me if the evidence suggested that the man had died through sexual misadventure. I said yes, and they closed the inquest as a death by misadventure. The reporter got no further replies from anyone, and the family kept what dignity grief in such circumstances can permit. Right now, just a quick word about the Cold Case Foundation, and then I'll come back and I'll recap the things that we learned from this incident and wrap this episode up. Out of the Cold is not just a podcast. It's part of a wider piece of work the Cold Case Foundation is doing at coldcase.live. A platform and app where we share our expertise in articles, training courses, and web series with people who want to support the foundation through small monthly or annual donations. You can become a supporter of the Cold Case Foundation by visiting coldcase.live slash join. It will cost you just $3.99 a month. The funds we raise are put to use in the ongoing investigation of hundreds of real-world cold cases. We are working across the world in conjunction with law enforcement to bring families the peace they deserve. You can follow us on social media too, by searching Cold Case Live on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn, and YouTube. We are always glad to speak to new people. You are the reason we do all of this. I've told you about this case because it has formative meaning for me. It brought together all of the evidence preservation and inquiry pursuit skills that you need in investigating complex and unusual deaths. There's always an explanation for what happened, and if you gather evidence methodically and verify its purpose and meaning by evaluating it, 
investigations come to sound conclusions and the right outcomes. Taking steps to preserve the scene and the evidence within it are absolutely essential. And where you do have to let people in, keeping a common approach path and a scene log can make the difference between forensic evidence being valuable or being ruined through contamination. An incident is not over when the blue lights stop flashing. Administration is extensive, purposeful, and includes the proper onwards management of the evidence, maintenance of the chain of custody, and all of those things until all of the proceedings are complete. Working with field experts is essential to confirming hypothesis and informing the judicial processes which follow, so you have to get things right, and this means being methodical even when the case is unusual. It's worth pointing out that not everything is a murder, and not everything is a serial killer, but every death has to be investigated properly to make sure that this is the case. Interfamily conflicts can be really difficult to deal with, but the duty of care that police officers have is continuous, and subsequently we have to do everything that we can to help everyone involved through difficult situations, protecting them wherever possible. I guess the thing for me is that what is interesting to the public is not necessarily the same as being in the public interest, and we would all do well to remember that, especially now that social media is as widespread as it is. For me at least, you never forget the little details. In this case, it was that faint creaking of the leather strap on the wooden beam, and the way the body looked like it was turning left to right, just in the corner of my eye. I didn't recognise exposure to things like this as trauma, at first at least. I just thought it was something that you had to deal with and get on with. In reality, these are the things that stay with you and they creep into your dreams and your subconscious. And this can eventually build into PTSD, which affects most law enforcement officers in some way, and obviously first responders too. But it affects everybody differently to varying degrees. The last thing I want to say really is, the next time that you hear an account of an event and it feels like a retelling for the sake of gossip or circulation figures and doesn't have a broader reason for being told or doesn't highlight important things about how you would approach an investigation or the considerations around the dignity of the victims, I'd just say, ask yourselves a simple question. Is this in the public interest or is it just something the public are interested in? If the answer is the latter, have an honest conversation with yourself. Stay safe. Thank you for listening to Out of the Cold and supporting the ongoing work of the Cold Case Foundation. If you aren't already a member, there's a place waiting for you at coldcase.live for the monthly price of a coffee. You can also help spreading the word by sharing this podcast with your friends, family, and social networks and by leaving a five-star review wherever you get your podcasts. Until next time, stay safe. Out of the Cold was written and presented by James Patrick. It was produced for Cold Case Live by Soshant in association with AWJ Entertainment LLC. The Cold Case platform and all of our digital content is made possible through Soshant. Original music is sourced through Storyblocks and the featured tracks are Slide the Guitar by Neil Cross and Deep in the Bayou by Patrick Smith.